Right, now there's a whole lot of interesting stuff to watch as we uh, wind up the voltage. First I'll turn on these. So what, what we're looking at here is voltage coming out of the variac into the ferro transformer and the current. The current coming out of the secondary as measured by two crappy clamp meters. The voltage on the secondary. That yellow line is uh, the primary voltage going into the trans transformer and the white one is the secondary voltage across all these light globes, globes down here. We'll keep them out of the way because I'm not going to see a thing otherwise. Notice that the primary and secondary are at this stage 90 degrees out of phase. That'll change as we wind up the voltage. So we'll do that now. So they're becoming closer and closer together in phase. Now we're at 10 volts output with 164 volts input. volts input 10.3 volts output so the, volt, the output voltage has only just gone up a little bit while we've moved this up like 40 volts all the way to 250 volts 10 and a half that, that's barely budged from 160 volts to 250 volts dropping it down again now Yeah, 150 volts odd. Uh, from 150 to 250, it's been within half a volt output. So it's it is indeed a constant voltage transformer. We're still mostly in phase, primary and secondary, but from about 120 volts down, they start to the phase starts to open up to. 90 degrees. Winding it up again. Wait for this guy to catch up. There we go. And of course, the secondary waveform is becoming much more of a square wave shape as, as we go well and truly into saturation of the magnetic core on the secondary. The currents on these, quite apart from the fact that they're cheap ass dodgy meters, uh, you probably can't expect accurate readings for non sine waves anyway, so at best. That's just an indication. 270 volts, 10.6. So to move half a volt down to 10.1, from 165 to 277, so 100 volts made 0.1 of a volt, sorry, a half a volt difference. So that's pretty amazing. Currents are pretty crazy too. Let's try and assess efficiency. Wind it back up again. Well, at, let's see what the peak's on. Now the peak was, on, with no load, the peak was at about 35 volts input. But with this load, it's no longer there. The peak is at about 65 volts then the current drops 
talk about the primary current. Okay, and we've got a new sweet spot. Looks to be a sweet spot, still around about 200 volts for the minimum. And then the current just goes up again after that. Goes up a lot from um, 250. 250 volts it was well, at 276 it's 3.6 amps at 240 it's half that almost half that it is half that <clears throat> yeah so <clears throat> you shouldn't over you shouldn't you don't want too much input look at that current's doubled just going up 30 volts so running at 240 volts, nominal input. Now I don't know how much we can trust any of these numbers we're looking at here because, well, certainly these ones, but this one might be still a bit dodgy too. We've got, let's call that 18, let's say 18 and a half, 18.5 times 10.5, 194 watts, and we're sticking in 285, so yeah, it doesn't win a prize for efficiency, but it does win a prize for constant voltage through a large input range. And also, of course, that square wave, if this was then going into a rectifier and filter capacitors, well, a lot of the work's already done. For the filtering, um, you get pretty small ripple there, so you could get by with smaller filter capacitors in your in your power supply. Now here's another little fun fact about ferroresonant transformers. I've got that output shorted the same terminals I had before. And we can see the currents down here. Okay, so winding it up. And of course we get pretty heavy currents in the secondary. Over 100 amps with 7 amps primary at 220 I don't want to blow the fuse so. but yes, as I understand it they're, on, they're almost short circuit proof but because of the saturation and the air gaps and the shunts and the rest of it um, it gets to the point where the primary just can't put any more current into it and, and it folds back to, well it doesn't look like it's folding back does it quite high current but I think if we did that with a conventional transformer the, that current would be much higher, the fuse would have blown long ago. 7 odd amps, 125 amps running there. And they're, they're starting to get pretty warm. I'll filter out surge voltages, so I'll cope with sags in voltage. And you can't short circuit them. They're pretty bulletproof. Just not very efficient. Now, the other thing about ferroresonance that I wasn't able to really test with it without a lot of mucking around is um, their efficiencies at different loads. Apparently, they are most efficient at their rated load. Uh, at light loads, they're less efficient. So that, together with the short circuit proof business, uh, makes it a bit of a problem because if you've got a load that has a heavy inrush current, then you need to size the transformer so that it won't fold back on that high input current. So it will supply the load with that high input current properly, but then when that input current subsides, you're running the transformer at much less than its rated load and therefore more inefficiently. So yeah, it's a bit of a dilemma there. So sizing them accurately is another issue. The Ferguson Lion Tamer thing, I believe is probably gonna be the other type that I saw in my research and that's considerably different to this we shall see in the next video when we have a look at the lion tamer catch you later